Welcome, New Covenant. So glad you're here. My name is Jay. I'm lead pastor. And uh, one of the earliest uh, advices that I got early on when I started to uh, talk was, uh, my earliest advice was like, all right, tell a joke and then run immediately to Jesus. And so I've, uh, I've had a lot of messages under my belt, but I've never actually started with a joke. And so I am. Today I'm starting with a joke. I got this from, from my daughter, from Abby. She goes, hey, hey, dad, um, what was Boaz like before he met, before he met Ruth? Ruthless. <laughs> That's, that sounded like a pity laugh, and so I will tell her, um, Abby, you're not funny. I mean, the people said it. So we are ra- wrapping up our series on Ruth, and Ruth is a great, great little book. I mean, it is teaching us, so every, every week I'm trying to remind you some of the big picture of what Ruth is trying to teach us. Ruth, Ruth teaches us God's heart. Like, Ruth was given to us because God doesn't just give us, like, cold, sterile, propositional truths. Oh, God is good. God is faithful. God is loving. I mean, that, those are true But what the Bible gives us is more than just propositions. It actually gives us like personal stories of real people who are demonstrating and showing us God is faithful, God is loving, and God is good. And God loves, he loves to save. And so I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you're thinking, man, God, I don't know if he loves me. I don't know if he delights in me. I don't know if he wants, he could ever save me. This book is meant to give you hope and confidence. He loves you. And so God, our God of the Bible is a God of redemption. He loves to save even the Moabite, the enemy, right? Remember, Ruth is a Moabite, and God is going, he has, and going to redeem this lowly person, this lowly Gentile woman, not because of righteous things she had done, but because of his goodness and his mercy and his love, which is why every week, and I'll say it again, right next to Ruth, put Ephesians 2.12, because what's true of Ruth is true of you and me, that God demonstrates his love towards us, that even while we're rebels, he died for us. And so you see the verse on the screen, that remember, if you're a Christian today, remember that at one time you were separated from Christ, you were alienated from him, you were strangers to the covenant, you were without hope and without God. And the story of Ruth is a reminder that God loves to save. Her story is actually our story. And so grab your Bibles, and we are making our way to the very last. We're wrapping up today. We're looking at Ruth 4. Ruth 4. So Ruth has been on a wild, wild ride. And so Ruth 4 is the culmination of this narrative. We've seen, like we've seen Ruth and Naomi, they go from broken despairing, hopeless, and as we get to today, now there's going to be overflowing goodness. There is hope. So so empty to full. Like in my Bible, I kind of outlined it a a little bit differently. Chapter one, you could actually kind of put for chapter one, you could say, actually, it's, it's empty to engrafted. Like they're engrafted in to the family of God. Chapter two, you see that not only are they engrafted, God begins to elevate this lowly woman. Chapter three, she's going to be embraced by a redeemer. And in chapter four, there is emancipation. There is full redemption. And so last week, if you were with us, last week we saw there is a willingness from Boaz. Here's a righteous man, a good man, a just man. He is wealthy and he is willing to redeem Ruth. He's wanting to save her. But there's a work that needs to be done a work that needs to be accomplished. In chapter four, we're gonna see it get accomplished. It's fulfillment. It's going to happen. Like what I would say, he who began a good work in him is going to complete it. He who is faithful will surely do it. He who is faithful to call you, he will surely accomplish it. And so that's what we're gonna see. Now, I'm gonna take a little detour here. So stay with me. There is a, it's kind of like center point road. You're gonna get here somehow. You just will, I'm gonna detour and I'll come back, right? So why, do you realize like why is Israel so special and so unique? Why is the nation of Israel so unique, special? It's because God took not any nation that was formed at the time. 
You know what God did? God created a miracle nation, and that's what Israel is. That's why they're special. God took a guy named Abraham who was in his old age, had no offspring, right? had no kids, couldn't produce kids. And God takes this guy who's as good as dead and his wife and creates a miracle nation. And not only does he create this miracle nation, he blesses this nation. He reveals himself to this nation. And they grow and they multiply, right? And they grow so big and so quickly that actually then they are, they're seen as a threat. That's why they're in bondage. That's why they're slaves in Egypt. And when they cry out to God, God is faithful to them. God has saved them. He will save them. He performs miracles, signs, and wonders, not because they're righteous and because they're good, but God in his grace longs to save and loves to save. Right now, I say all that to say this, like God saved this unique people, but he didn't save them then to just leave them to themselves. He saved them and began to instruct them. He saved them in order to separate them and to sanctify them. And he says, I want you to actually live and look like me. I want you, you're gonna be a visible representation to the world about who I am and what I am about. It's why, incidentally, one of their first commandments was don't make for yourself idols. Don't do it. Don't make a calf because when you represent this calf, that doesn't represent me well. It actually distorts who I am. And so you don't get to make an idol to show me off. But what's interesting is that God was actually shaping them, crafting them. It was almost as if God was using them as idols. Like, you, you are gonna represent me. You are gonna show who I am so that when they see you, they actually should see me. They were meant to be distinct. They were meant to be gracious. They were meant to be hospitable and clean. But you know what they're also meant to be? They were actually meant to be redeemers. God was, even in the law, God says, I want you to be a nation of redeemers. Little redeemers, is that what you can be like? It's almost like a little league team name. Here you're gonna be, I want you to look like me. I want you to reflect me. And so they were called to be redeemers. You see it in Leviticus 25, Deuteronomy 25, so that when someone maybe got themselves into trouble, they might've become poor, they lost their land, they said, you can redeem them. Like you could buy back their land and you would restore their land. God forbidden monopolies in the Old Testament. If you became so poor that you became a slave, that God says, you could redeem that person. You could buy them out of slavery and restore them. You could, if, if someone died, like if a husband died and left a widow, and that widow didn't have any sons to provide for, her, right? just like Ruth and Naomi, a near relative was called to step in and redeem and to save. God wanted, God wanted his nation to look like him, to be little redeemers. It wasn't a suggestion. It was actually an expectation. Do this because I've done this for you. Now, it wasn't forced. It had to be an act of grace. But God, this is what God wanted. And so live and look like me. So I say all that because we need to look at, again, the Redeemer. The nation had a, remember the term last week? It's called a goel in Hebrew. It means a kinsman redeemer, someone who can step in and save when they got themselves into a lot of trouble, whether it was financially, where, they, where there's no provision, no hope. And so let's look at the kinsman redeemer in chapter four. And what's interesting is that you're gonna see four of them. There are four redeemers that we're gonna look at today, right? The first one, right? Remember, there's a problem. There's a problem. Boaz is willing to redeem, but there is a problem, and the problem is found in verse one. Chapter four, verse one, look what it says. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate, sat down. There, there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned, came along. And Boaz said, Come over here, my friend. Sit down. And so he went over and sat down. And so in chapter four, right, Boaz right here, he's at the town gate, 
right? For those of us who don't really know, I didn't really like, like, so the town gate is where disputes are gonna be settled. The town gate is where you went when you had complaints, when you had disputes, when you had problems. You wanted them settled, you go to the town gate. You didn't just go off to some nearby field, you didn't go to the local tavern, you went to the town gate. And there at the town great gate was a group of elders, and the elders would then hear the complaints, the disputes, the problems, and then they would settle them. So it's the courthouse of the day. And so court is in session. Boaz is bringing the problem to the judges, to the elders. And he says, let's settle this dispute and this problem. Now, what the question you should be asking, do you remember, what's Boaz's problem? The problem is that Bo, Boaz is willing, he is willing to be the kinsman redeemer, the Goel for Ruth. He is willing. The problem is, is that he's not the nearest relative. Remember, there's qualifications in order to be the redeemer. You have to be the near relative. You have to actually have the riches or the, the wealth to do it. You have to have the means, the finances. And you have to be willing. And Boaz was all of these, but the problem is, is that there's a closer relative. There's someone else who is able and like, who has got like a closer lineage. Was it a brother? We don't know. Was it a cousin? We're not sure. And so Boaz is bringing this issue to the court, to the elders. And so he sees the closer relative. The closer relative is in town. He sees him walk by. It just so happened he walked right by and he says, hey, you, come, we're going to solve this issue. So if Boaz is going to be the redeemer to Ruth, this is the first step. This is where it begins. Now, I don't know about you. Like, I, as I'm, I'm processing and reading God's word, there's a part of me that says, man, man why, why, why does he do this? Right? If, if it's me, maybe some of you, like, maybe that, let's just conceal this a little bit. How about play the ignorant card? Right? Is it, some of you are just like me. Don't, don't, don't look like you're not. Right? It's way easier to, what, to apologize than to ask for permission. And part of me says, hey, why doesn't he just say, hey, I didn't, I didn't realize there was a closer relative. If he's wanting to do this, play the ignorant card. Or if it's not the ignorant card, to say, well, yeah, my bad, I apologize. Or he doesn't have the mindset, you know what he could have done? He could have dragged this guy. It's like, hey, you, taken him behind the woodshed, said, I'm going to redeem this person, whether you like it or not. See, Boaz doesn't do that. Why? Because Boaz has an incredible character. Boaz is good. He is right. He is upright and he's honorable. And Boaz does all that God has required. Now, the reason I kind of, I ask that kind of question or like, why doesn't he just conceal it? Why doesn't he just like play ignorant? Why doesn't he, he threaten? Because here's the question I was asking myself. And I ask you, how are you at trusting God when you want something? I know every single one of us, we have desires and wants right now. And so how are you? How are you when you want something, how are you with trusting God? Even when it's right or even when it's like good, can you trust God and can you wait? Right, when things get hard and things get challenging, I mean, the last thing we want to do is leave things to God, like God's hands. Like, we want to take matters into our own hands. I don't know about you, but there are often times where it's like, God, I'm going to help you out. A, a couple weeks ago, like, actually, in our previous series, we just kind of got out of a series on the Holy Spirit. And in the very first week, I, I shared my, my story, how God got a hold of my life. I mean, God saved me in a very dramatic fashion. I mean, there was, it was undeniable that God was moving and God was at work. Now, afterwards, like, what I don't think I shared during that testimony is that, so God used these guys, these twins, in a powerful way. And I remember after I was like, I gave my life to Jesus, I was thinking, I want to do something. I want to, whatever these guys that were discipling, whatever they say or whatever they've done to grow in their faith, I'm going to do that. And what Campus Crusade for Christ offers college students, now known as crew, 
They offer summer projects. It's like a summer mission trip where a bunch of college students from all over the country come together and they go to like different locations. And they were talking about how their time on a summer project transformed their life. And in my head, it's like, I'm doing that. I'm going on a summer project. And so I was like, all right, give me the application. And as I started reading my way through the application, I was like, uh, that's not true. Nope, nope, haven't been pure. Nope, didn't do that. I mean, I, and in my head, I was like, all right, do I tell the truth or do I lie like a mug? Because I need to help God out. Because the desires of my heart was, I want to grow. I want to learn the Bible. I want to learn how to share my faith. I want to have community with other, like, college students my age who love Jesus. And so I did what anybody would do. I didn't tell the truth. I lied my way through the entire process because I needed to help God out. That's not Boaz. Boaz isn't do, taking any kind of shortcuts because Boaz has incredible character. Well, let's look. Let's look at Boaz, though, because he's got great character, but I like him. He's shrewd. He's got some slyness to him. Look at verse 2. Look what he does. So Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has... Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. Now, incidentally, I didn't say it. I confess when I got out there. All right, I'm not just a complete liar. All right, sorry. I had to feel like I had to say that. All right. Um, so here, so notice, so, so Boaz, he, he does not start, as you read verse 2 and 3, Boaz doesn't start with the real issue. He doesn't start with Ruth. He doesn't talk about redeeming Ruth. Who does he start with? He starts with Naomi. He starts with land, right? The first problem on Boaz's agenda is not Ruth. It's land. It's a really old widow, right? It's not marriage. And so he's letting the court elders, the court, he's letting this, this first redeemer, the person who is closest to Elimelech, he's saying, hey, a property needs to be saved. There is an, an older woman, an old widow that needs her property restored and she needs provision. She can't afford it. You need to buy it and actually keep it in the family lineage. Now, does that sound very enticing? Right? There is nothing enticing about that dilemma. Right? Would you want to buy back some distant relatives' land or home. I kind of I talked about it last week, right? None of us would want to do that. One of, it, actually, one could argue that Naomi and her family, they lost their land, their property, not because, actually, because of poor, poor choices, poor decisions. They left Israel. They left their land. And it, yes, granted, it was a famine, but it's not like they, they went right back in. They left their land, they left their property, and they were gone for 10 years. And now they're coming back, and now, now you get to use your finances and your wealth and your riches to restore them back. Does that sound very nice? Sound enticing? It doesn't to me. Right? I wouldn't be all that excited about buying my cousin's house and then giving it right back to them. So that's the ask. That's the picture Boaz is painting. It's brilliant. Boaz is slick. He's wise. I like him, right? And so Boaz, I mean, he's known in the community. He's a well-known man. They know that who he is. He's upright. He's benevolent. He's wealthy. And so what Boaz is doing, he's like, hey, I'm giving you this opportunity, buddy. You have the opportunity to redeem this land and this widow. Say, go ahead. You go ahead. Redeem it if you want, but if you don't, if you won't, I will redeem it for you. Now, you see what he does. See what he does in verse two. It's almost like a two-part setup. That was problem one. Problem two. So, verse four, you see it. I thought that I should bring the matter to your attention 
and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you're going to redeem it, do so. But if you, do, if, if you will not, if you don't, tell me so that I know. For no one has the right to do it except you. You are the closest redeemer. You're the first redeemer. So you have the ability to do it. I'm next in line. So Boaz is, I'm spoiling it, he's the second redeemer. I will redeem it, he said. If you don't redeem it, that's okay. I'll do it for you. So I don't know, like at this time I'm thinking, I mean, here, here all of a sudden, I don't know if this guy knows he's the redeemer. I don't know if he knows that, hey, Naomi's back. And maybe he's just trying to ignore it. He doesn't actually want to do it. We, we're not told all the background. Right? Maybe, maybe in his head he's like, I, I would like to redeem it. I know I should. God has asked us to do this. But in all honesty, maybe he doesn't want to do it. And so he's probably at the edge. Do I do it? Do I not do it? But that's only part of the problem. It's not just that there's land problem. It's not just that there's a Naomi problem. The next problem is there's a Ruth problem. Now, to be fair, is Ruth a problem to Boaz? Not at all. Boaz delights in Ruth. Remember, Boaz is wanting, he is willing, he wants it. But is it a perceived problem to this guy? You better believe it is. It's a big problem. That's why in verse five, he doesn't just stop at, at land and just Naomi, verse five. Then Boaz says, hey, and, but just by the way, on the day that you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow. In order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, right? He say, hey, just so you know, when you're shelling out your money, when you're getting rid of some of the things you've been, like uh, the, the wealth you've been accumulating, you're just not shelling out money for land that's not going to be yours. And you're not just shelling out money for land that you're going to have to provide for Naomi. Hey, you also, right, you also have to provide for a Moabite, there's a Moabite woman, an enemy, someone that he probably doesn't care for. You got to provide for her as well, right? And if you're this guy hearing this news, what are you thinking? I guarantee you he's just crunching the numbers. He's just seeing dollar signs going left and right. And so this first redeemer, do you see what he has to do? This first redeemer has to buy the land. Does he get the land? No, it goes right back into the family. Not only does he have to buy the land, he has to, and it's, he has to provide for Naomi, her provision. And not only caring for Naomi, now he has to marry a Moabite. And so this first redeemer, right, to be this redeemer, he has to count the cost. Right? Is he willing? Is he wanting? Because he's got to do a whole lot of spending. There's a cost to this purchase. Is he willing to count the cost? And this man, as he's processing all this information, he says, the cost is too high. The cost is too high. It's going to cost him too much. It may cost, in his mind, he's like, it may cost me everything. So when he purchases, like just, he, when he purchases or when he redeems, like he's, he's like, his assets actually aren't increasing. In his mind, they're actually decreasing, right? In the end, he's gonna lose the land. It doesn't go to him. It won't go to his kids if he has a family. So in verse six, what does he say? At this, the guardian redeemer, the first redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it. I cannot do it. And so this first redeemer, as he counts the cost, says the cost is too high. I am not willing. I won't do it. It comes at too much of a great price. And so when I look at this, I'm like, man, Counting the cost, 
counting the cost. One, I was like, I look at redemption even. What, is this not actually a great picture of humanity? Right? Man can't save. Man, this redeemer, he, 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 either man doesn't have the heart to save or man does not have the resources or the means to bring full redemption. And so he's not willing. He's not wanting. And so when this guy backs out, part of me just says, and I don't, I have no, this is all conjecture. I can just see Boaz like, yes. <sighs> Clenching his fit, fist. It worked. God provided Because I don't think, when this guy says, no, I'm not willing, there's nothing in the text that says, like, Boaz is not disappointed. I think Boaz is ecstatic. Because Boaz is good, he is righteous, he has the means, and he is willing and wanting to be a blessing. He's not dishonest. And so Boaz does what he said he would do. He steps in and he redeems. He is the second redeemer. Look how he responds. Verse nine. Then Boaz announced to the elders and to all the people, today you're my witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Chilion, Malon. And I have also acquired Ruth, the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family and from his hometown. Today, you're witnesses. So Boaz, in the presence of all the witnesses, redeems. He redeems the land, he provides for Naomi, and he redeems Ruth, right? He redeems. He's he's not like the first redeemer. He's not unwilling. He's willing. He's not like the the first redeemer who was motivated by what? By self-preservation. He was motivated by self-protection. This could hurt. This could hurt me physically. That's not Boaz. Boaz is willing. He's not motivated by self-preservation. He's motivated by love. And so he is not dishonorable. Actually, like the first redeemer, he is honorable. He's an honorable man. Isn't it? It's so interesting. I look, I look at, at Boaz and it's like, what a great picture of redemption. What a great picture of God. Again, how so? Is that Boaz was willing to take their debts. Like, right? He gets their debts. And what do they get? They get a new lease on life. He takes all of their debts and all of their pain and they get a fresh start, a new beginning. The first redeemer was not willing to do that. He was motivated by self-preservation and the like, to which you might be saying, well, Jay, aren't you being just a little bit hard, hard on this guy? No, I'm not. I'm actually not. And I won't read the passage. You could actually go there. I actually put it on the screen, but um, it's, it's Deuteronomy 25. God said, hey, when you actually don't do this, Right, Ruth or Naomi had every right to take the matter to the court, and you—I mean—you look at it. it. Says right in the presence, if they're not willing to do that, if this guy wasn't willing, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face, and say, "This is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line." Whew. This was not a small thing, but Boaz is a willing redeemer. He's a willing redeemer, and so we've seen two redeemers. One is willing, one is not. One is motivated by love, one is motivated by self-preservation, self-protection. There is a third redeemer. Verses 13 to 16, this is the third redeemer. Look at, verse 13 shows. Boaz is gonna marry Ruth. They get married, they're gonna have a child. They're gonna provide, they're gonna provide a son. So verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive And she gave birth to a son. The woman said, the woman said, become, I lost my place, right? The woman said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you. He has not forgotten you without a guardian redeemer. 
May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who's better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. It's interesting that this text tells us that the child that was born, the son that was born to Ruth and to Boaz is a redeemer too. Right? It's like the tides have absolutely changed from the beginning of the book. Right? When there was darkness at the very beginning because they are empty, they are broken, there is no provision, God has brought great delight now. They were empty, now they're full. Where there was bitterness, right, now there is blessing. Was, was uh, Naomi bitter? She was. That's why in chapter two she says, stop calling me Naomi, which means pleasantness. Call me Mara because God has dealt bitterly with me. And here God says, I have been faithful, I am faithful, and I always, I always provide. And he provided a son. This is the third redeemer. This son is going to be the one that actually brings now Naomi future blessing, future provisions as well. Because guess what? What happens if Boaz dies? They're in the same predicament. They're in the same problem. And God in his faithfulness actually provided a son. And so God always, always comes through. And when he comes through, he comes through with abundance. There was no promises at one time. At least that's what it felt like to her. No provision, no peace. Remember, that's why early on, she just kept encouraging both Ruth and Orpah, don't go back. Don't go back with me. I can't promise you anything. I can promise you one thing, nothing. There's no perks. There's no provision. There's no peace granted. I can't give you any of these things. And yet God in his faithfulness provided an abundance. He provided a gift. And the baby from God is a gift. And so she was, was bitter. She was empty. And now, now she is rejoicing. In fact, this young redeemer is actually going to renew her life and sustain her in her old age. Isn't it interesting, though, right? As we kind of wrap up, we have a baby, a baby who is born where? In Bethlehem. This baby was born in Bethlehem, and he's going to be a redeemer to Naomi, someone who was empty, who was bitter, who was unable to support himself, and this baby is going to bring life and blessing and provision. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? It should. Right? It sounds like Jesus. Now, the remaining verses, I'll come back to that. The remaining verses, you see the lineage of this baby. It's not just any, any old baby. It's the lineage of a king. Because Boaz, Ruth, have a baby. That baby, his name is Obed. And Obed's gonna have a kid, probably several kids, but one of those kids is gonna be Jesse. And Jesse's pretty significant because Jesse's gonna have some kids too. And Jesse's gonna have a, a great kid. His name is David. And David is beginning, he's going to become probably the greatest king in Israel. And God is going to delight in this guy so much that he's going to make a promise to David in 2 Samuel 7, saying, hey, just so you know, you're not a perfect man, David, but you're a man after my heart. And because of you, right, you're, you're going to have a house. I'm going to give you a house and not just a house, I'm going to give you a throne. And not just a throne, you're going to have a kingdom that's going to last forever. There is going to be a king that comes after you that will reign for eternity. And so who is that king? All right, you go to Matthew chapter 1, we see that king. And we get to trace his lineage. We trace all the way from Boaz and through Rahab and through Ruth, and we go all the way, we get to see Obed, we see Jesse, we see David, and we see another baby who was born in Bethlehem. And this baby is going to be far greater than the baby in this day. This baby just changed like one family. 
provided provision to Naomi and Ruth, right? Gave life to this family. There's another baby, Matthew 1 talks about, who gives life not to one family, but to the world, to the nations. This one is gonna be the ultimate redeemer. This fourth redeemer will take away the sins of the world, Matthew 1, 21. And so do you see, like, do you see the heart of God in Ruth? So God says, I am a God who saves. I am a God who is faithful. I am a God who redeems. That's my heart. I love to save. Even the lowly, even those who seem like our outsiders, foreigners, who are enemies of God, I, I will bring blessing and life to those who will come to me. Ruth is great. It's an incredible book that teaches us about an incredible God. And so um, the kinsman redeemer, the ultimate one is not Boaz. The ultimate kinsman redeemer is Jesus. And he is willing and he will do whatever is necessary to actually bring full redemption. You just gotta come to him. Saying, I am poor, I am helpless, just like Naomi, will you save me? And he will. Let's pray. God, your word is, it is very good. Whether our heart recognizes that or not, you are revealing yourself to us. And ultimately, you have revealed yourself to us through your son. And the word became flesh and has dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is as the only son from the Father. And God, if there is anyone here, that's my prayer. If there is anyone here or online, that feels, my, my heart is that they feel poor, they feel helpless, they feel needy, knowing they need salvation, they need to be saved, they need you to step in. And so God, would you direct their hearts to the ultimate redeemer, the ultimate baby and savior who gives life to our poor estate, where you, just like Boaz, you take our debts, our sin, our shame, our offenses. You take those and you give us a new lease on life. You give us cleansing. You give us forgiveness. And you give us the righteousness that we can never earn or achieve. God, direct hearts to Jesus, I pray. And all God's people said, amen.